Carlo Rovelli. Turket, turket, turket check. Hey everyone, hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the top 100 books of the 21st century according to The Guardian. Now I have some reasons as to why I chose this list and why I'm going through this list with you today that I'll, I will get into with the meat of the video. I haven't actually dug into this list. I saw the first couple and then I was like, oh, I want to do it live with you all. There might be a little bit of crowdsourcing, a little bit of like, I've never heard of this book. Is it good? Tell me your thoughts. As much as you can tell me about the book, whether I have read it or not, as just a general zeitgeist to this list and what we think about this list as a community, I would really, really, really love that. So um, grab a snack, grab a cup of tea. I have a feeling this will be a long one. It is 100 books. But, you know, it's a hundred books. If this happens to be your first time to my channel, then hi, welcome. Maybe, maybe it is your first time. Um, welcome here. And uh, my name is Shelly. I really love books and reading. And I have been on a low key project to foster contentment in my life. And this list actually is connected with that project. So if you are um, liking the vibe and you would like to stick around, I would encourage you to subscribe, like the video, and without any further rambling on, let's go ahead and get into the meat of this video. I'm gonna do all of this while getting ready, by the way. I, I have this whole look, look in mind. I really want blue buffed out eyeshadow. I want like the sky on my eyes today. And I'm just really excited about that look. And I'm gonna be talking about, about this, <laughs> about the list with you. Now why I chose this list is because I was tempted to go over some of the more like brand spanking new lists. For example, the New York Times just put out their 100 most notable books of 2023, which is a wonderful honor to make it to that list. However, I am working on a project entitled Project Shelf Aware, in which I am reading more from my shelves. I am paying attention to my shelves more and that I have a conscientiousness of what's left on my shelves unread. And so a list focusing only on the current year of which we are living will only render me a sort of either grumpy, like I feel like it could be two things, grumpy because I don't own any of the books on the list or like my trying to reroute that the feeling of excitement that I get from books that I can't get my hands on yet and trying to reroute that excitement back to my own collection. And I thought I would have a better chance of, oh, I have a visitor. This is what I was getting at. I have bought very few new releases. Instead of trying to get it up and get excited for books that I don't own, there is more of a chance that I will have several books. Like I will currently own several books by the, the those on the list of The Guardian, you know, because it my my time period is the 21st century like despite my own self as much as I would love to be a reader of ancient classics like a consistent and vigorous reader of ancient classics or a super fan of the Victorians I tend to want to read um, books that were published in the last two decades and so there's going to be a, a more a, a likeliness that I will have not only read several more of the books on this list covering the last 20 years than, than like the New York Times 100 most notable books of 2023. But also, it's also more likely that I will own and have unread, like I will have unread books from this list in my own collection. And it won't, it won't, you know, make me feel like, oh, like I want that book. Like I won't have conflicting feelings about it because, you know, these are not brands making new releases. So with that lengthy sort of reasoning behind it, hopefully I will have some timestamps for you all down below. I'm going to start getting ready and we're going to go through this list. I always have a moment where I'm like, I hope I was clear. I hope I said what I wanted to say and it had some clarity to it, but we're going to, 
it's fine. I'm scooting to the side so there's plenty of room for pick dolls and I have my computer right here. From what I'm gathering, the number one pick is the Guardian's number one pick. So um, we'll have that to look forward to. So hopefully they'll be getting better and better as the list goes down in number. So number 100, I Feel Bad About My Neck by Nora Ephron, published in 2006. I read this book. Nora Ephron famously wrote probably my favorite movie of all time, uh, When Harry Met Sally. Love that movie with a passion. I have had a crush on Billy Crystal since I've seen that movie. Not just for that movie, but I think Billy Crystal is the bee's knees and then some. I, I can't believe I'm admitting that on camera. Oh my gosh. Um, I just have, I just, I just think Billy Crystal is the, like the best thing since sliced bread. And partly it's because of his character as Harry in When Harry Met Sally. And um, so anyways, I feel bad about my neck. It's essays about her observations uh, of, living, of living as a writer in New York. And it's funny, it's cute. It's also like her thoughts about being a woman and being an aging woman. And she has this accessible humor to her that is both, it's kind of like a crust it's a little bit like Jerry Seinfeld, like the mundane, but it's the mundane of a writer in New York. And there's just something about that that is charming and sweet, and I really quite liked it. Number 99. Can't promise that I'll remember to say the numbers too, but I'll try and, you know, I'll try and say them so that we can keep track of where we're at in the list. But this is the first book that I've never heard of. Promising for me. Broken Glass by Elaine Mambanku translated by Helen Stevenson. It was originally written in 2005 and it was translated into English in 2009. This is, this was translated from the French, originally written in French, and it is a black comedy told by a disgraced teacher without much in the way of full stops or paragraph breaks. So it's kind of flirting with, um, con not contemporary, uh, experimental literature, which usually isn't my thing. There's an unreliable narrator and the term, it says the author's unreliable narrator munches his bicycle chicken and drinks his red wine. All right. Well, that does not sound very promising. Nothing about that description is appealing to me, but I would be curious as to what you all say. 98, <laughs> The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Stieg Larsson, translated by Stephen T. Murray. The original was published in 2005 and it was translated translated into English in 2008. And I read this, I read the whole trilogy. I know there are more beyond the trilogy, but a lot of people said that you can stop at the trilogy and it would, you know, it has a nice closure after you finish the third book. And that's, that's exactly what I did. It was a really enjoyable, it was a really enjoyable series. It has a, techie, uh, plays by her, her own kind of rules, does her own kind of thing in a very unhinged way, Lizbeth, and she's working with a reporter to like take down the big guy, the take down the big guy. <laughs> That's, and his name is Michael Bloomfest. I really, I really enjoyed this, like the whole series and it was quite the ride. Playing off what the Guardian said about this book, Scandi Noir, that's what it is, like Scandinavian Noir. This was like the gateway drug for a lot of people into Scandi, Scandi Noir. And it just was, it was huge. And there's just been so many copycats since then. So I could see why it makes the list. 97, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by JK Rowling, published in 2000. I read this years ago, years and years and years ago when I was a child and this was, The Goblet of Fire was her first, J.K. Rowling's first book in the Harry Potter series that was just obnoxiously long. As a child, I didn't think that. I thought it was amazing that the book was, you know, 700 pages or however many pages it was. And it was also one of the more young adult feeling books. The first three books, this is the fourth book in the series. The first three books feel very childlike. And then you get to this fourth book and all of a sudden, Harry is getting to the age where he is like a more mature teenager and you're dealing with more of that kind of subject matter like crushes and friendship debacles and you know all that kind of stuff 
And so I just remember that. I remember when it came out too. This book should be way higher on the list in my honest opinion and it is A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara published in 2015. It tells the story of a tight-knit friend group and it starts to focus in on one character in particular, Jude, who has a truly tumultuous past. I mean, the past is brutal. His life is brutal with a capital B. This is the 21st century's Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy and I am not surprised that they're actually, the main characters are named, named the same thing. It's it's an it's an enticing, incredible, engaging, super dark, super dark read. Number ninety five, Chronicles, Volume One by Bob Dylan, published in two thousand four, and this is Bob Dylan's memoir. I didn't even know he wrote a memoir. Number ninety four, Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, written or published in two thousand. I have read everything that Mike Malcolm Gladwell has written up until his last book. The last book I read was Talking with Strangers and, and I didn't read any more after that. I was like a Malcolm Gladwell super fan but in a weird way. I really enjoyed arguing with Gladwell and I thought he wrote really entertaining narrative nonfiction even if I didn't always agree and or even often agree with what he was saying and I've definitely grown out of his writing in the last three or four years. <laughs> but I, I have, yes, I have read a lot of this. And, and the tipping point is really, it's really intriguing. He makes some really interesting points and it's about epidemiology um, and how epidemics start. And when it goes from, you know, like how it tips from it being just like a, a crisis to an epidemic. 93 is Dark Men's by Nicola Barker, published in 2007. I don't know much about her or her writing. I think she's a bit experimental, which tends to not be my jam. 92, The Siege by Helen Dunmore, published in 2001. It is about a family in a battle against starvation, um, and it's set in the, uh, the German siege of Leningrad, which I just read a book about the siege in Leningrad, and it was, I literally had to get up and like check. It was um, City, oh my gosh, I have to like look up the author. City of Thieves by David Benioff. And it was, it was, it was good. And it was set exactly during that time period. And the, I'm curious, have y'all read Helen Dunmore's book? I would be curious as to what you all say because I find it quite intriguing. I'm I'm curious about this one. I'm unsure if this is actually doing what I wanted it to do. I said it want I wanted it to fuel the passion for my own collection, and instead I'm like that sounds good and that sounds good and that sounds good and that sounds good and that sounds good. Huh. Number ninety one, Light by M. John Harrison. This is a space opera that I've never heard of. Space opera fans, tell me about it. Have you read it? And this came out in 2002. Okay, so number 90, Visitation by Jenny Erpenbeck, originally written in 2008, translated into English by Susan Bernofsky. And this is, the setting is a grand house by a lake in the east of Germany. And not only is it the setting, but it is the main character as the house switches, switches hands um, from different owners one of which is going to be a Jewish family and then it was um, acquired by a Ru the, the Russian army and so and then it's sold again. I've never heard of this novel but it sounds intriguing and apparently it's a, the third, it's her third novel. I thought it was the third book in a series, it's her third novel. I say this with love. No, book number 89 is Bad Blood by Lorna Sage, written in the year 2000. It's her memoir. And of course, it's going to chronicle her dysfunctional family and her grandparents that don't get along. And it sounds like a hot mess express, but in the best way. I've never even heard of Bad Blood. And then the author, unbeknownst to her, gets pregnant at 16. And then The Guardian promises us a happy ending with the book. So interesting. I've never heard of this memoir. Number 88 is a book that I've definitely heard of. And I've even, I think, flirted with buying it 
here, there, and everywhere. It was a booktube, darling book. Booktube love this book. And it's uh, number 88 is Knots and Crosses by Marjorie Blackman. Toll, uh, written or published in 2001. And it is a, you know, post-apocalyptic kind of young adults fiction, I think. And it's supposed to play with um, the concept of race and it's set in Britain and it's just I just remember when it came out and it was so big and I've always like wanted to read it. I've come to accept that I'm going to have interruptions because I live in a chaotic household. So my camera died, <laughs> the battery died, I needed to change the battery pack and what I was saying was that I think that I've always wanted to read this book. I just never have gotten to the point where I pick it up. Number 87 is Priest Daddy by Patricia Lockwood, which I was surprised to see this on the list because the book I know Lockwood for is No One Is Talking About This, which was honored by the booker in the last couple of years. This is pre that book. Priest Daddy was written before No One Is Talking About This and it was written in or published in 2017. I think I was just surprised and delighted to see a familiar name on the list. Number 86 is Adults in the Room by Yanis Varoufakis and it is supposed to be one of the best political memoirs ever written. This was originally published in 2017. Number 85, The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, originally published in 2006. It is his hard-hitting book about new atheism. Number 84 is another book I've read, The Cost of Living by Deborah Levy, written in or published in 2018. This is her memoir talking about being, she covers the subjects about being a mother, a divorcee, like a newly divorced woman, and a writer. And it's her quiet musings on everyday life in that position. More technical difficulties ensue. I will not be blighted. Number 83 is a series of essays entitled Tell Me How It Ends, written by Valeria Luiselli written in 2016, translated with Luiselli by Lizzie Davis. And this is going to be talking about New York's immigration court in a series of poignant and troubling essays. Number 82, another one that I have read, Coraline by Neil Gaiman, written in 2002. A children's book, fantasy horror-esque, that is, I would say, middle grade or younger middle grade, fifth, sixth grade type audience. And it talks about a young girl who's lonely and gets herself into some fantastical trouble. Another book I haven't heard of, but you must tell me about it. Number 81, Harvest by Jim Crace, originally published in 2013. And it is the story of dispossession and displacement as one era gives way to another. Does that, does, does that not sound so good? Number 80 is Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang, originally published in 2002. And this is going to be eight short stories. They're high concept in science fiction. Not surprised that I personally haven't heard of it. Number 79 is The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. And I guess this is a study based on evidence that was revealed when they looked at rich countries. And it says that growth matters, according to them, growth matters less than inequality. And so they talk about life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, crime rates, obesity, literacy, recycling, and they do that in Scandinavian countries, from what I gather. Number 78, a book that's still widely popular now and still read, The Fifth Season by N.K. N. K. Jemison, originally published in 2015. One of my dearest friends, Fraser, says that you have to read the whole trilogy to really understand the entire series. So I flirted with picking it up and I'm sure some of you are screaming at me to pick it up, 
but I just don't know whether I want to invest myself in a chunky three book series. 77 is Signs Preceding the End of the World by Yuri Herrera and it's translated by Lisa Dillman. Originally published in 2009 and translated in 2015 and this is going to examine border crossings from those living in Mexico coming into the U.S. Number 76 is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kein Kahneman. Kahneman. So he's a uh, the, a Nobel laureate and an unexpected, unexpected bestseller. And it's about, about quick decision making and the science in the brain about quick decision making. We're definitely going back and forth between books I've heard of and books I haven't heard of. This one I have heard of and it's Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead at number 75. And this is by Olga Tkertik. <laughs> I've had so many people trying to help me with that and I still butcher it every time. Originally published in 2009 and translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones in 2000, 2018 and it's a existential eco-thriller. I know the author because of the book of Jacob which was a huge book last year, a couple years ago. I know people who read it said it was like mind-blowingly good and also very academic like mind blowing, mind blowingly good, but also incredibly academic. Number 74, Days Without End by Sebastian Barry. Sebastian Barry's name has recently popped up in our consciousness yet again, the, the consciousness of prize following readers, because he was just uh, long listed for this year's Booker. So that's what I think of. But this book was written in 2016, and I know he's a very well-established author. This book is quite intriguing me. Nothing to, en Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick, originally published in 2009. It's a journalistic piece of narrative nonfiction in which she interviews about 100 North Korean defectors. And anything about North Korea intrigues me, even though I haven't bit the bullet and actually read something about, specifically about North Korea. Ooh, a book that I think is a bit before its time, and it is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, and it's by Shoshana Zuboff, originally published in 2019. This is book number 72, by the way. And one of the quotes is, once we searched Google, but now Google searches us, which is an ominous quote. And you can kind of see what that's about, just the way that capitalism and technology are converging. Oh, a graphic novel that I actually haven't heard of, and it's Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth, and this is by Chris Ware. I've not heard of this. I want to look it up right now. Book number 71 on the list, and it was originally published in 2000, and this is an emotional and artistic complexity um, talking about the listless life of a 36-year-old office dog's body, huh, and it's about his existential crisis. Sounds fascinating. Would love to see the art. Number 70 is Notes on a Scandal by Zoe Heller, written in 2003. This is about a middle-aged teacher in London who begins an affair with her 15-year-old student. This sounds like the My Dark Vanessa of 2003. Number 69 is The Infatuations by Javier Marias, in, written in 2011 and translated into English by Margaret Joel Costa or Joel Costa, 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 I don't know, um, written, <laughs> which was translated in 2013. And this is a Spanish murder mystery with hints of love tied in. Every once in a while, I get an author on my brain and I can't stop thinking about that author. And I like really want to pick up something by that author. And the author that I'm talking about of my current obsession is next. And it is John Le Carre. And on of book 68, it is his book, The Constant Gardener, um, written in 2001. From what I know about his books, they are Cold War literary thrillers with a heavy dose of literary. Number 67 is a book I have read, The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker, written in 2018. This book has a magnificent cover, by the way, but the book didn't exactly work for me. It is a retelling of Homer's The Iliad. Like she, she tells the story from a female point of view, but not all of the aspects of the book worked for me. 
particularly the characters. I struggled to connect with the characters in that book. Number 66 is Seven Brief Lessons on Physics by Carlo Rovelli. And that's fun to say, Rovelli. And it was written or published in 2014. And it is going to give you a brief introduction to quantum mechanics, cos cosmology, elementary particles, entropy. And if you're interested in stuff like that, I mean, I'm not not interested in stuff like that. I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, sometimes it's like those types of things sit in the dusty corner of my brain. And it's like, I see a list like this and it makes me be like, it makes me, my reaction is like, do I want to read something about physics? Maybe I am a phys physics girly. I mean, nothing is outside the realm of possibility, right? Number 65, a book that took the world by storm, Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn, written in 2012. And my goodness, this book was on every list imaginable. I own the book. I know the twist because someone spoiled it for me. And I just don't know if I want to read it. And some people are like, read it anyways, it's still so good, but I, I just don't know. And it's it's a thriller. And it, it does that thing where, you know, it's like, it's a thriller, but it's also talking about the intricacies of marriage, you know, as like an underlining theme throughout. Number 64 is Stephen King's nonfiction book on writing, which is on the topic of writing. And it was written or published in 2000. And this is after Stephen King's like fatal or near fatal car wreck. And it really changed like his outlook and thoughts on the world. And so anyways, but it's his nonfiction book. And from what I've heard of some people is that if you're not a fan of his fiction, like myself in particular, I don't really love his fiction. But, um, you know, it, this nonfiction is actually pretty good. However, I found out that Eudora Welty, though she's not a 21st century writer, Eudora Welty wrote a book with the exact same title that is like supposedly, according to Steve Donahue, a billion times better than Stephen King's version. And it's like a slim 100 pages and it's so elegant and beautifully written. And so if I'm gonna read a book entitled On Writing, it's gonna be Eudora Welty's rather than Stephen King's. Ring number 63 is a book that everyone and their mother has read, including my own mother. <laughs> and she loved it. Like my cousins have read it, everybody has read it. I'm the last person on earth to have read this. And it is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sloot. And it is talking about science and the ethics of science. And so there is a woman, Henrietta Lacks, she's a black woman, and her cells are taken without her permission. And it's, I think the story of her cells, like the actual, like what they did with her cells and her family and like, the ethics behind it all. Number 62 is a book I read this year and actually kind of recently, Mother's Milk by Edward St. Auburn. This is about a rather messed up young man named Patrick Melrose. And I love that it is, it's like he takes the idea of like, what is language and what is language to us and how do we build language? And if you are all a fan of like literary theory, he takes the theory of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and he looks like what uh, St. Auburn, the author does, author does is look at it with a whole bunch of different ways. And I, this tickled, tickled my funny bone when I read it because I learned about Jean-Jacques Rousseau's theory of language and experience in college and it fascinated me back then so it felt like I was kind of going back to old familiar roots when I read this book. I would highly recommend it, especially if you're a fan of like the con like the concept of language and our experience and you have maybe a bent towards literary theory, I think you would get a real kick out of it. And number 61, it's another nonfiction book and it is This House of Grief by Helen Garner. And it says a man drives his three sons into the deep pond and swims out, leaving them to drown. Was it an accident? And apparently she, you know, she talks about this account. That sounds like I could, my eyes are stinging. I cannot, I cannot think about that right now. Um, that's how tragic, but it's supposed to be rich with uh, humanity. So that's a good thing, but I just, 
I don't know, that kind of stuff, it just, it gets me. Oh, a book of poetry. I think this might be one of the first on this list at number 60, and it's Dart by Alice Oswald, and it was published in 2002. Oh, The Poet and Carson uh, comes in at number 59, and it's called The Beauty of the Husband, and this examines uh, love and desire, which sounds really good, and it is considered itself a fictional essay of 39 tangos. Interesting description of it, but intriguing nonetheless. Number 58 is Postwar by Tony Junt, originally published in 2005, and this is a grand survey. I'm going to read this because it's a grand survey of Europe since 1945, and it offers a panoramic narrative of the Cold War from its beginning to the collapse of the Soviet bloc which sounds epic, to be honest with you. That sounds quite epic. Another book I have flirted with here, there, and everywhere, like I think about buying it and then I don't end up buying it, and it's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael, Sh Michael Shaben. Um, this was originally published in 2000, and it is a an account of two Jewish cousins who are like, they're nerds. They're like two little, two young nerds you know, that are friends and cousins and Jewish and, um, and it is, they have an anti-fascist -fa comic books superhero called The Escapist. And, um, it's supposed to be great. And I've heard such good things about it, but I just haven't, I haven't done, I haven't, you know, done the thing. I haven't bought the book. I haven't picked it up. I think I've even gotten it out from the library, but I just haven't done it, you know? <laughs> I haven't quite done it. The one thing I'm already not really loving about this list is that it doesn't parse out whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So I believe this is a nonfiction book and it's Underland by Robert McFarland, first published in 2019. He takes the reader on a bunch of voyages to places sort of unknown. Um, so it would be to the fjords, um, the Arctic, to the Parisian catacombs, and he thinks about humans' effects on the planet, which I feel like is more relevant today than ever. Another book that I've heard of because it had a moment, and it is The Omnivore's Dilemma. This comes in at number 55 by Michael Pollan, or Paul, Pollan, I think, and it was first written in 2000, or published in 2006. And it is just our effects of humans on the planet eating animals, and it's about food and plants and thinking about all of that stuff. And I know it was a very, very popular and effective book. Number 54 is Women in Power by Mary Beard. She is a well-known historian and she uh, wrote or published this book, or this book was published back in 2017. And it's based on, it, or it thinks about misogyny and the origins of gendered speech and it's supposed to, oh it's a slim book it sounds really good i kind of want to buy it coming in at number 53 is a book that i own and haven't read and it's the true history of the kelly gang by peter carey first published in 2000 and this is his this is a booker winner set in 19th century australia that sounds so good it sounds so good. I've heard only amazing things about Peter Carey's writing. Number 52 is Small Island by Andrea Levy, first published in 2004. This is going to be a London, set in London, and it's going to be talking about prejudices as we look at four protagonists. So two are Jamaican immigrants, um, and then two are a what the Guardian is calling a stereotypical English couple. And I guess, you know, that clash is really going to give us some tension and explore some things about humanity. I've nothing, I've read nothing of this author, but I've heard of this author often enough. And it is at number 51, Brooklyn by Colm Tobin, or to Tobin, not really sure how to say that. And it was first published in 2009. And it's about um, how when 400,000 people left Ireland and the impact of immigration on one woman in the 1950s 
and it's set in Brooklyn, New York. Ah, uh, Margaret Atwood makes the list, and it's Oryx, or Oryx and Crake. Oh my gosh, it's a hard name to say, and it's at number 50, um, and it was originally published in 2003. This is, of course, one of her dystopian books in her Mad Adam trilogy. Another name I recognize but have not read, Jeanette Winterson, coming in at number 49, and Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, and it is you know, Wintress and I know has her own way of writing both her fiction and nonfiction. The nonfiction that I know is orange. Oranges are not the only fruit. And this book is kind of a follow-up memoir, um, I think about her later life. Oh my gosh, they included the 29th book of a series. Am I reading that right? <laughs> the 29th book. Wow. And only, only Terry Pratchett would have 29 books or more in a series, and it is it is his book Nightwatch coming in at number 48, and this was originally published in 2002. Another book I own on this list, and it's coming in at number 47, Persepolis by Marjane Strapini, translated by Matias Rita, and it is her coming-of-age graphic novel of the lead up to the Iranian Revolution. It's a book that I've been meaning to read for ages. The poetry collection of Seamus Haney, Human Chain, comes in at number 46. This book was originally published in 2010, and I love to see yet more poets making a list like this. An author I know of but haven't read of, read any yet, rather, coming in at number 45, Levels of Life by Julian Bars. I think he also read, wrote The Sense of an Ending and some other books that have made their way to popularity on booktube. But Levels of Life, that was originally published in 2013, makes the list. And it combines fiction and nonfiction with essays on grief and love. I own this author's work, though not this particular book, coming in at number 44, and it's Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. Her fame, claim to fame was Men Explain Things to Me, and I own the, what is it? My goodness. Uh, my re Recollections of My Non-Existence. Hope in the Dark, the book that they feature on the list, was written in 2004, and it is going to be her writing about the war in Iraq. Number 43, another poet, which I love to see, Citizen and American Life by Claudia Rankin, originally published in 2014. And this is going to be talking about the history of racism in the US and focusing on the events of Hurricane Katrina. A book that I know of and the movie was so big, the book was so big, and it's Moneyball coming in at number 42 by Michael Lewis, uh, originally published in 2010. And this is going to be how the story, my goodness, as I itch my nose, the story of how geeks outsmarted jocks <laughs> using math. Um, I love that. I love that. I'm a math teacher myself. And so I kind of want to read it now. Ah, a huge book by a huge author at number 41, Atonement by Ian McEwen, originally published in 2001. I've read other of McEwen's novels, namely on Chesil Beach, which I thought was good, but not great. I think that there are super fans out there, but I know Atonement was like his big, big work, and I don't know too much about it. Let me know. I'm sure there are some of you who have read this out there, and I wonder, how did you get along with it? Another big book by a big name author, nonfiction, and it is at number 40, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. I read half of this, and I found it far too sad to finish, at least at the time. It is her musings on grief following the year after her partner's sudden death. Probably one of the biggest books that has come out in the 21st century is White Teeth by D Zadie Smith, written when she was a mere babe, still in the cradle, and it was published in 2000. And I know that it is one of the most maximalist works out there. Number 38 is The Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst. This is going to be a Thatcher era, Thatcher, a Margaret Thatcher era novel, and it's going to be focusing on how AIDS began to poison gay life in London. This was originally published in 2004. Another author for whom I have read 
is coming in at number 37 and that is The Green Road by Anne Enright. I own The Gathering and I have read Actress by her and Actress was great. She is clearly a master at her craft and so The Green Road is going to be an Irish family, a story of a, a, the story of an Irish family and the way that they all come together. Apparently the stories are told all individually and she's able to tie it all back together swimmingly. Number 36 is Experience by Martin Amis. This was originally published in 2000 and this is his memoir, but I know nothing about him. So yeah, you'll have to help me out on that one. Okay, number 35, The Hair with Amber Eyes, a book I've not heard of, but sounds really good. And it is by Edmund DeWall, originally published in 2010. And it's a memoir that is about a collection of items called netsuke, which is small Japanese ornaments. And it's about um, the way that objects play a certain role in our lives, like in the reflections of our lives. That sounds good. That sounds really interesting. A book by an author I'm not sure I'll read, and it is Outline, coming in at number 34 by Rachel Cusk, originally published in 2014. It's an autofiction work. From what I know, it's sort of plotless, but with beautiful writing. <laughs> That's what I've heard about the book. And that kind of just, I don't know. There's something about that that you would think maybe I would really love that, but there's something about that that kind of like makes me stand on guard. Ooh, the next book is a book I've read, Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. This is her memoir graphic novel about the complicated relationship she had with her father. I read this over a decade ago and really enjoyed it. Number 32 is a book by an author for whom I have read and it is The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. I read The Song of the Cell, which was his musings on, well not musings, but research and history of the cell, which was super interesting. And The Emperor of All Maladies is his thoughts about cancer. Um, I heard it's amazing and he is a very talented writer. Love Story meets Memoir in the next book, coming in at number 31, The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson, which sounds very interesting. I feel like I've seen this book around and I've never picked it up. Number 30 is a book I have read, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which is such a tightly written, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, incredibly tightly written, um, Whitehead's prose is so articulate and sparse but in the best way. However, this is the story of a sort of alternative reality of the Underground Railroad in the U.S. of trying to get um, slaves from the Deep South to a place where they are free and it gave me nightmares for the entire week that I read it. The first installment of a very long memoir it looks like Yes, and it is A Death in the Family coming in at number 29, and it is by Carl Uwe Kierkegaard, sorry y'all, translated by Don Barlett. It was originally published in 2019 in its original language, and it was, it was translated in 2012. Um, I'm starting to get silly, which means that I'm probably, um, I'm probably getting a little bit tired, but anyways, um, it, uh, whether or not you regard him as the Proust of memoir. I don't know. I have read some Proust and I do like, I think his writing is very beautiful, but you know, it is, it is long-winded. So I don't know if uh, A Death in the Family is for me. Number 28 is Rapture by Carol Ann Duffy, a book length poem. Short stories by Alice Munro comes in at number 27 and it is hate ship, friendship, courtship, love ship, marriage originally published in 2001. Number 26 is Capital in the 21st Century and it is by Thomas uh, Piquet Piketty? Piketty? Piketty, probably. Translated by Arthur Goldhammer, um, published in its original language in 2013 and translated in 2014. And here is the message that the Guardian says, unless governments increase tax, the new and grotesque wealth levels of the rich will encourage political instability. Interesting. Number 25 is Sally Rooney's Normal People, which was 
published in 2018. I read this and thought it was entertaining, but definitely not deserving of the accolades that everyone seems to give it. It charts the story of an up and down relationship of two teenagers and their on and off again like relationship. It was good, but not great. Next is a book that I own but haven't read and it is Jennifer Egan and her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad. This is number 24 on the list. It was originally published in 2011 and it made quite a splash. I just have to, I have to get around to reading it, you know? Number 23 is The Noonday Demon by Andrew Solomon, originally published in 2001. Apparently it's a literary memoir that focuses on depression and mental health. Number 22 is 10th of December by George Saunders, published in 2013. I own a couple of Saunders books and I still haven't read them yet, which I feel like I'm doing myself a disservice. And 10th of December is a short story collection. Number 21 is a book that I feel like, again, everyone has read, <laughs> not me. And it's Sapiens by Yuval Nora, Noah, Nuval y Noah Har Hariri, Hariri translated by John Purcell and Chaim Waltzman. And it is the history of humanity, like the history of Homo sapiens, um, for which I feel like, again, everybody has read but me. A book by an author that I have kind of a crush on, and that is um, number 20, Life After Life by Kay Atkinson. I own this book on my Kindle, and I've read two Kay Atkinson's books so far, and I literally have a girl crush on her. And I think this tells the story of a woman who, like, is reincarnated, but as, like, this same person. I think it's about reincarnation, but I think she's like, I think every time she's reincarnated, she takes something or remembers something from her past life and brings it into her current life. And in that way, it's like a multi-generational family saga, but with a spin of like some sci-fi in it, you know, or like magical realism, I think we would say nowadays. Number 19 is another book I've read and it is The Curious Incident, Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon, originally published in 2003. And this follows a 15 year old neurodivergent, he might be odd, artistic little boy who's trying to solve a mystery and you're inside of his head and I liked it but I didn't love it I thought it would be more groundbreaking than it was but you really get to see the perspective is from somebody who moves through the world very differently than a lot of people and in that way it was really interesting but not a favorite read of mine Number 18 is Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein, originally published in 2007. And this is the ur urgent examination of free market fundamentalism. Okay, <laughs> I don't know much about it. I've never heard of the book. Number 17 is The Road by Cormac McCarthy, originally published in 2006. I own this book. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And it is a post-apocalyptic book that is supposed to be very sparsely written. And I don't know, I just don't know if Cormac McCarthy is for me. And so it's one of those books that I tend to just push to the corner of my brain that I'm like, I'll read it maybe, maybe one day. Number 16 is The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen, um, originally written in 2001. Do I own the, I own either, I own Freedom by Franzen and The Corrections, it's like Freedom and, Freedom and The Corrections were both so popular for him. They were like his big novels. It, it's what put him in the consciousness of most readers. And um, and so I'm not surprised. And this is a, uh, this is a unhappy American family that struggle at, to adjust to the shifting axes of their world, of axes of their worlds over the final decades of the 20th century. So apparently he's a really good author. I just haven't read him yet. A nonfiction book about the planet and what we're doing to the planet and the crisis of plants and animals on this planet and the way they coalesce with human like humanity or human civilization and it's called at number 15 the sixth extinction by elizabeth colbert originally published in 2014. oh a book i i, I own this is exciting and now i really want to read it but it's um fingersmith which is at number 14 by sarah watchers uh originally published in 2002 
and it is she's just known to be to writing like Sarah Water Sarah Waters is known to write slow moving historical fiction Victorian-esque style novels and I've just always felt like she was for me and so Fingersmith is on my list. Number 13 is Nickel and Dimed by Barbara Ehrenrich, uh, originally published in 2001 and she takes a look at what it, what it is like to live on minimum wage. So she looks at a waitress, um, a cleaner, and then a nursing home aide and the struggles of life um, living with that living on that financial level. This, I don't know if I said it, but it originally came out in 2001. Um, and then a, bu a book by an author that I don't want to read, and it is number 12, Plot Against America by Philip Roth. Um, and this is, what if, it says, what if aviation, what if aviator Charles Lindenberg, who once called Hitler a great man, had won the presidency in a landslide victory and saw, signed a treaty with Nazi Germany. So it's a historical retelling. No, that sounds that sounds paranoia, para, paranoia and anxiety inducing for myself as a reader, but it might be your thing. Next up is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante, which was originally published in its original language, Italian, in 2011 and translated by Anne Goldstein into the English in 2012. This is the story of two friends living in a small village in Italy and it charts their tumultuous friendship. And I loved it. It was so good. It was one of my favorite books of last year. Number 10, top 10, woot woot, Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamandia Ngozi Adichie, <laughs> originally published in 2006. This is a, a Nigerian author and it is going to, it's her sweeping and evocative novel that won the Women's Prize. And it's supposed to be really good. It's about the brutal legacy of um, colonization in Africa. Oh, two more books I've read. This is a surprise. What a surprise. Oh, three books. Oh my gosh, three books I've read in the top 10. Okay, again, I, I, haven't, I haven't gone through the list, so this is exciting. So number nine is Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, originally published in 2004. This is um, inter, I, yeah, structurally, it's like interconnected but weirdly woven short stories but that go totally off the rails in like the middle of the book and it is so good it's such a good book it's one of those books that weirdly has stuck with me even though i read it several years ago it was when i first finished it i was like whoo i feel relieved but like it still has stuck in my brain totally off the rails though like when the further on you get in the book the more off the rails it gets and it's really good. Number eight is a book that worked less well for me and it is Autumn by Addie, Allie, Sm Addie Smith. Allie Smith written or published in 2016. This is her first book in the seasonal quartet and it's like one of the first um, Brexit novels. It's very playful with language and I could see why a lot of people love her but I think that my expectations going into the book was out was not in line with what the book was actually giving and so thus I was a little bit disappointed. I do think a, a large dose of that was me, but it was a little more slow moving and like a nothing happens kind of novel than I had expected. And then number seven is Between the World and Me by ta Coates, uh, first published in 2015. I read this book, I've read this book two or three times and it is three letters to his son about what it is like to be a black man in America. They are hard hitting, they are profound, and I learned a lot from them. And to, to Coates, he has my eternal gratitude. Next is a book that I have not read, but everyone says I should re read, read, should have read. Um, and in number six, it is The Amber Spyglass by Philip Pullman. And it is part of his, his Dark Materials trilogy. I have not read his Dark Materials. Again, I know, I know what I'm missing out on. And I know I really need to read it, but I haven't yet. I don't even own a copy, but I, I haven't yet. And so it's one of those things where I'm like, I know y'all, I know. I hear, I hear the, the cries and the beggings to have me read this. And I just haven't, but I want to, you know, I want to. But yeah, it made number six and it was originally published in 2000. Next is W.G. Sebald's 2001 novel, Austerlitz, um, translated by uh, Athena Bell. So it's a genre-defined mix of fact and fiction. 
Um, and it's going to be talking about the Jewish diaspora that has been the Jewish diaspora and loss in the 20th century. I don't, I just don't know. I just don't know about it. Like, um, I just haven't read any Seabald and so I'm not really sure. Like, I'm not really sure, you know, about it. Number four is a book, again, that I've read. Wow, I've read a lot of these. Oh my goodness. Um, and it's, uh, number four is Never Let Me Go by Kazuha Ishiguro. It's a slow moving meditative and thoughtful science fiction book that is more poignant and sorrowful sorrowful than I thought. I liked it but didn't love it. Number three is a book by an author. I own another book by her but I'm really curious about her stuff. I'm just holding court with my mascara here. But number three is Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexevich translated by Belina Shevich. Uh, and this is about ordinary people. They create an oral history, which that's what Alexevich's work is all about, creating like an oral history about the Soviet Union and its ends. And she, of course, interviews lots of people and it's all in their voices, but in this Alexevich way. I've read the beginning <laughs> of my book, which is, I can't remember. I've read the beginning of one of Alexevich's books. And so I know, I understand what they mean by an oral history. And she just has a way of sort of like, um, of, of getting a multi-perspective story, uh, account, I guess, more told in all of these different voices, but all sort of cohesively saying or s saying the same thing or coming around to the same point. It's really, uh, she's got a very interesting, um, you know, writing style. So number two, I thought this was number one, but this is number two, and I've read it, Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, written in 2004. It's a very quiet, this is an incredibly quiet novel. Since I'm at number two, I'm like, maybe I should powder and stuff. The book is really quiet, and it's an older man writing to his younger son and meditating about his life, and there is just such compassion and kindness that bubbles right underneath the surface, and that's what's so unique about Robinson's writing is that she is just, she's got this well of compassion and empathy that's just waiting for the readers right there, like right in your grasp. And um, it's very much like a book without a message, but with a clear message. But it doesn't feel like there's a message. Like, it's so good. It's, I don't know how she did it. She's just an amazing writer. But Marilyn Robinson definitely deserves to be number two, depending on what number one is. I don't know what number one is. Let me, oh, let me get myself together. Let me powder a little bit so that I'm actually done with some lip gloss. And then we'll see number one together. <gasps> oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes, queen. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Number one is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel written and published in two or written but you know I don't know it was published in 2009 this book is so good this is the first book in the Thomas Cromwell series or the Wolf Hall series depending on how you want to say it and it is phenomenal phenomenal it is a single perspective book like we're in the head of Thomas Cromwell but we're in his head in a very unique way I love this book I love this book and I'm so glad it's number one and you're like in the Tudor court and there's a Tudor drama and I love like Thomas Cromwell is one of my favorite like the way that Hilary Mantel wrote Thomas Cromwell specifically in this series and no other I love him like I adore him I just love him so much and I'm so glad that this is number one she was you know re re rest in peace Miss Mantel Mrs. Mandel. Like, she's just so, such a good writer. She's such a good writer. Okay, I'm done. Um, wow. So let me go to the center and then I'll wrap up. Well, that was so much fun. Thank you so much. I have no idea how long this was, but you know what? I don't really care. I don't really care. I love this so much. This is definitely, like, my era, like, the 21st century. As, you know, again, much to my chagrin, it's sort of, like, the books that I tend to buy from the most like in the last 20 years and the t books I tend to read the most in the last 20, 25 years. Um, it's like the, the place that is my happy place as a reader. And so it was really awesome to see The Guardian come up with such a comprehensive list of the best 100 books um, published, you know, in the last 25 years. Although I don't really know when the list came out. The book, the list came out in 2019. And so that's why we're not seeing, you know, some of the, like the books of Jacob on there by Olga to 
Um, <laughs> I don't know why that book came up. Um, or, you know, Patricia Lockwood's No One's Talking About This. So, you know, it, it's very understandable that we're not seeing the books that came out in the last four years, but it was so cool to just see what they thought were the best books. And it was such a surprise and such a joy to see their number one book. And ultimately, some takeaways from this list. I really loved that there was a wonderful mix of fiction and nonfiction and translated works. I love that the works seem to span a bunch of different genres and topics and styles and just it just seemed very rich and full and I really thought that there was a good balance from what I saw though I didn't chart anything out of authors um, of like male and female authors and I just thought that it was just like it just seems like a very thoughtful list um, and that it's being published by uh, perhaps a group of people you know a bunch of people that kind of you know molded and shaped the list um, and it's not just from like one person's perspective. So I know that if I were to make a list of the best 100 books of the last, you know, of, in the 21st century, like it would be very much tailored to what I like to read and to what I have read. And this seems just very broad and far reaching. And that's something I really enjoy. So it's varied, far reaching, broad, and that's all very awesome. And I didn't I don't think it was exactly like every other was fiction and nonfiction. I think that there was a heavier emphasis on fiction books, but it was really great to see the mix of fiction and nonfiction come together. Even though, weirdly, I would say that some of the nonfiction books, like some of the memoirs, are almost passe at this point. They're from people that I've literally never heard of, and you know, I don't know if they're incredibly relevant in this moment, but it's so funny because in this moment, some people who I think have very relevant memoirs um, that are coming out in 20 years from now will probably not have a relevant memoir. And so it gives, you know, it gives me a sense of like what stands out, what has stood the test of time, um, what are we still thinking about today, what still feels relevant, what still feels um, modern and accessible, and then what books have sort of faded as time has progressed. And, um, you know, and so this was just a wonderful, a wonderful look and a wonderful way to spend my time. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here and spending this time with me. I just tremendously, absolutely wonderfully appreciate it. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye. Varufakis? 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 Varu, varufa, varufakis? Varuf, varufakis? Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Demek. Demek. Mm -hmm.